Okay, so Catherine, are you ready to, you okay to get started? Yeah, all set. Perfect. Well, listen, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm, I've been particularly looking forward to uh, today's session. Um, bear with us if there's any IT issues. They've been going quite smoothly the last few, but if there are any, do just bear with us and hang in there. And as is usual for these sessions, just in case you've not done one before, we're going to have about 25, 30 minutes um, at the start where Catherine and I are going to work our way through some questions and have a discussion. And then we're going to allow the second half of our time together um, to take questions from you, the audience. So if you'd like to ask Catherine a question, please submit it using the Q&A um, button at the bottom of your screen. And then uh, my trusty sidekick will be looking at the questions as they come through and then passing them on to me so I can ask them on your behalf uh, when we get to that point of the session. Um, in case you've not dealt with Campaign for Common Sense before, uh, we launched last May. And we're here just trying to encourage more grown up conversations about difficult issues, sensitive issues that often create more um, heat than light. We believe that no one's got a monopoly on right and wrong. We think that actually on these difficult issues, we've got a lot more in common than it might first seem. We think that common sense and fair play are the best way to approach those issues. And we think we can talk about these difficult issues, frankly and calmly, without trading insults. And it's with that in mind that I'm really chuffed to have Catherine along this afternoon, because over the last 10 years or so, Catherine has in so many ways embodied and modelled that approach to some pretty tri tricky situations that she's found herself in, but also in the last few years as she's got more involved in uh, discussions around broader social issues, she, she's gone about things in that way as well. So for those of you that don't know, Catherine um, is founder and headmistress of Michaela Community School. It's a new state secondary school that opened in 2014 in Wembley Park. Um, if you go and visit the school and thousands of people from around the world have been to visit it, from the outside, it, it looks like a not particularly um, interesting office block. But when you get inside, something really magical is taking place there. Um, I actually first met her, and Catherine will indulge me for a minute, I actually first met Catherine on stage at a Conservative Party conference in 2010, um, and it was on the education day of the conference, and um, four people involved in schools and education had been invited to go on stage to talk about their experiences. And I had foolishly offered to go on last out of those four people, thinking that I could do something a little bit jolly just to wake people up again and send them on their way. And Catherine went on stage just before me and gave an absolutely rip-roaring, phenomenal speech. Um, and I will never forget walking on stage to her third standing ovation um, and delivering my quite run-of-the-mill um, average speech um, and thinking to myself all the time, you never learn, do you? So I've been very lucky to know Catherine now for, for over a decade. Um, she's not just the founder and head teacher for school. She's helped write and edit a couple of books, which have really helped her change the game in many schools in the country and elsewhere. And also you'll always find her talking on uh, podcasts, uh, in the media. She's a very, very popular commentator and expert in the media and elsewhere. Um, and quite nicely and quite appropriately, uh, she received a CBE in um, the honours last year. So Catherine, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I've been keen to get you on for ages and it's really nice to, to do it. So what we'll do is we'll just start off with the first question that I love to ask all of my guests. And that is, when you go back to your school days, um, what was your favourite subject at school and what was your favourite bit of school life? You know, it's funny, no one has ever asked me that before because, you know, I've done <laughs> lots of uh, podcasts and interviews and all sorts, and no one's ever asked me that. And when, um, uh, you know, you, you suggested that as a, as a possible question, I thought to myself, um, gosh, you know, I don't really ever think about my school days. And, and maybe actually, now that I do think about them, it might explain why I'm so passionate about education because I don't think I liked school much. I, I'm not even sure I could tell you what my favorite subject was because I really didn't like school. And I didn't like school because I was really tall and really thin and um, and everybody, I had really short hair and everybody would say, are you a girl or a boy? I was also the only black kid in this all white school. And well, I say all white school, certainly in the, in the, in, in, in the top set where I was, um, that was the case. And um, I was made to feel very uncomfortable. There was lots of bullying. The teachers couldn't control the lessons, the classes. 
uh, people weren't really learning very much. There was just constant chaos. And I, and it, it yeah, I mean, I, I, di I didn't really like school. Uh, and of course, my experience in teaching after that was to see much of the same in, in, in classroom, yeah. after classroom, after classroom, you know, in, in various schools. And so it might explain really why I'm so passionate about trying to change education for children, because uh, I had one friend I remember, and uh, if she wasn't in, because uh, I worked hard and I was considered to be a bit of a of a neek, and you know, uh, and and so I couldn't be cool, and and plus, as I say, I was tall and not attractive and all that sort of thing. So, if she wasn't in, I had no one to hang out with, and I'd just kind of stand around. And it, it's hard for children, I think, at school. So, yeah, I, I know. I, that that's my answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but was, was there was there any part of school life, if it wasn't a particular subject then, that you look back on fondly? Or is it more actually you look back on it now and you realise what you've done since then is a reaction to that? Um, Were you involved in plays, music, sport, anything like that? Not really. I d I don't <laughs> I don't really look back at school and think there were nice bits. I mean I had this one friend who um I'm still friends with, you know, th this was mainly school in Canada. I also went to school uh, for a couple of years here uh, doing A-levels and I'm still very good friends with her. So that is something to cherish because, you know, it, at my grand old age now to still be very dear friends with my friend who I knew since I was six years old, it means something. So, um, so yeah, her, I'd say. <laughs> so with hindsight then, do you think that's what got you into teaching? No, no, okay. no, 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 not at all. So what got me into teaching was um, I was at Oxford University and uh, they would all, when you're at Oxford in Cambridge, I presume also, you know, they, they have these milk rounds and you have to, you know, they, the big companies come along and tell you about McKinsey and what it would be like to be a management consultant or whatever. And I would go along to these presentations and think, oh my goodness, I couldn't bear doing any of that. So um, and I had been involved in this access scheme, which would send, uh, at that time, it was about trying to encourage ethnic minority students to apply to Oxford. And they would take ethnic minority students and send them off into uh, various inner city schools, say in Manchester or Birmingham or London. And we would uh, talk about our experiences and what it was like to um, be at Oxford. And the idea was that these kids would see you and think, well, actually, look, she's doing all right there. It's OK. I, I can I can apply too." And I would find that when I would uh, talk to the kids, I would change their minds. They would start off thinking, no way would I want to go to Oxford. And then by the end, some of them applied. And so I thought, oh, well, this is a way to make a difference. Uh, and at the time, I thought uh, schools were failing because of typical kind of reasons that the left would kind of believe in, I would say, stuff like there's not enough money, there's lots of racism in schools, you know, sort of white racist teachers, uh, you know, not not pushing black kids and that kind of thing. And yeah. I thought I would go in and try and change things. So um, that was what, you know, encouraged, that, that was what inspired me to become a teacher. But then obviously, like, once we get into teaching, it is a tough job. And you said yourself, you know, a lot of your experiences in working in schools were not that different to what you experienced as a pupil. So what was it that made you stick with teaching? Yeah, um, well, I, I know lots of people leave teaching because they um, find it really hard. Uh, I, I didn't find it so hard. I, I was sort of like a fish to water. <laughs> I just loved it um, from the moment I started. Uh, I loved the kids. I, I loved the challenge of, of the classroom. I love it's so hard teaching to get it right. Um, it's so hard to be able to spin all the plates that are necessary. You know, um, you've got to keep them eating out of your hand. You've got to inspire them at the same time. You've got to know your subject. You've got to keep the discipline while also making it interesting and fun. And when I say fun, I don't mean in the kind of progressive way of fun, but yeah. um, <laughs> so uh, it, uh, it's really hard. And I like doing things that are hard. Uh, so I loved it from the moment that I started. And I remember, you know, I had this plan when I started that I, you know, I wanted to my original plan in teaching was that I was going to turn around a failing school. And that was right from the start when I began. Um, 
I, I, I was never going to, I was always going to work with disadvantaged kids. I was always going to work in the inner city. I just loved it. So it wasn't, I wasn't about what made me stick with it. I mean, I can't imagine doing anything else. And it, it was a big problem for me, obviously, when, uh, when my, I gave that speech that you mentioned earlier. Um, and I was told I would never work in the state sector again because it was my whole life. It, 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 I, I love it. I, I, it's never been the case that after a holiday that I'm worried about going back to school. I don't ever think, oh God, got to go into school. I'd never think that. I mean, whenever the holidays come, I'm always ready for them and I like having them yeah. and it's nice to have a rest, but I never have that feeling of, oh my goodness, I have to go to school. And so I just love it. There's nothing that I love more. So it was really devastating for me, obviously, after that speech, when I when I was told, well, look, you, you, you can't do this anymore. Cause I just thought, well, what am I gonna do? <laughs> you know, it's what I live for, so yeah. Yeah, and, and that brings, actually, that brings me on to the next question I was going to ask. So if we go back 10 and a bit years ago, um, you and I, in different ways, were going through rough patches trying to get schools open. So I, I was fortunate. I chose to leave my previous job with the support of my then boss. And we were struggling to try and find a site and we're, uh, we're facing a battle with the local council and the unions and whatever. You were going through similar things, but in a much more high profile way, I think. And also you'd been kind of squeezed out of a job that you love. And then, if I remember rightly, you were, you were sort of hoping to set up your school in one part of London, and then I sort of described it as a bit like Moses and the Israelites wandering through the desert. You were looking for a homeland. Like, again, what kept you going through that time? And also, what was it that made it all click and come together in the end for you? Yeah, um, well, it took three and a bit years to open the school, and there were a lot of detractors. And I remember you as well struggling and all of us at the beginning trying to set up free schools, I ha you know, I have huge respect for all of us because it, it was just so tough. Um, and there were so many people who hated us and, uh, you know, people protesting, calling me names, sending me racist emails, sending me all sorts kind of threats. Um, we had to hire a bouncer once uh, because there was so much, we were so scared about the possible violence that might uh, occur at one of our parents' evenings. We tried first to open in Lambeth, then we went to Wandsworth. We finally ended up in Brent. Uh, it took, as I say, over three years to open. Um, our detractors did a really good job of, of trying to stop us. And people look back, well, people don't look back. People just see us and think, oh, well, the school has just happened. They don't realize uh, how much determination it took to, make, to get it to, to open. And frankly, there were so many obstacles along the way at any one of them, it would have been perfectly reasonable for us to have just given up. And it wasn't just me. It was also our group of governors uh, who at the time were our steering group and were working with me to to, yeah. us, to get us open. And so um, we did have to overcome a lot of negativity. We, you know, we'd have parents evenings, people would infiltrate and sit amongst the parents and then stand up and shout at us to stop us from being able to communicate with the parents. I mean, it was awful. And in particular, it was awful when I think about in Brixton, for instance, going around Brixton Market, giving out flyers, these mums would say to me, oh, so desperate for another choice of school. This is so great. And then they'd turn up to the evening and be shouted down by these people who had been bussed in from outside of London, uh, mm -hmm. who weren't even part of the community to stop these people from having another choice of school. Uh, it really is outrageous. And, and it's outrageous. And, and what's extraordinary is that these people who were doing this, of course, felt that they were doing the right thing. You know, <laughs> they weren't doing it because they believe them, themselves to be bad people. They think that they are good people and they think that I am, you know, obviously a bad person and need to be stopped from opening up a school. So, um, yeah, that was really hard. But then we opened in 2014 with uh, a group of year sevens. And this year actually is our first year of being full all the way up year seven, right through to year 13. So it's our seventh year and it's really exciting because, uh, you know, our first set of GCSE results in 2019 were really excellent. You know, progress eight put us at number five in the country and we, um, we, we've done a good job. So uh, we get 600, I mean, obviously it's COVID now, so that's not happening, but you know, normally we get 600 visitors every year, mainly teachers from across the country, but also all over the world who come to take ideas back to their schools and so on. As you mentioned, we've written a couple of books and you know, these are books written by our teachers. You know, each of them have take, has taken a different chapter and written about what we do. So it's really exciting. And it's one of those, um, 
we are one of those stories uh, that, you know, prove the point that you just need to keep going and you keep persevering when things are down and, you know, eventually you'll get there. <laughs> but actually along the way, as well as persevering, you've had to, you and your team have had to engage with loads and loads of people who are, are on loads of different issues who disagree with you. And I said at the start, one of the things that I think is admirable about how you and your team have gone about stuff is that you've, you, you've engaged with those people, you've not shied away with it. So a couple of questions on that, like what do you think is the key to disagreeing well with people? Um, I think one of the reasons why people have been uh, persuaded by me, and I do know uh, there have been many, you know, people I meet at places, they say to me, I. I, I never used to agree with you, but I, I, I see what you're saying now. I've been following you on Twitter for the last three years. And um, over those three years, I've changed my mind. Or they've been to the school for a couple of times. And the first time they came, they weren't really sure. And then the second time they came and having listened to podcasts of mine or followed me on Twitter or that sort of thing, they've then changed their minds. I think part of it is the idea of what I just said, which is that you just keep going. Um, so partly it's keep keeping on going and not allowing yourself to get, uh, you know, sort of upset or depressed by the negativity. Uh, the second thing is, I think people, um, especially because I'm, I'm, I lean to the right. So the people I'm trying to persuade are, are those on the left. And uh, those in teaching are often on the left. So yeah. uh, I think that they uh, are often convinced that people who lean to the right are bad people. You know, they think that they have some kind of motive that's uh, a personal motive for gain, personal gain. And I think if you keep on going, and if it is just demonstrable that you are not doing this for personal gain, uh, they will be convinced be partly because they're then open to listening to what you're saying because they can, they no longer think that you're a bad person. Cause if you yeah. start off by thinking somebody's a bad person, you're never going to listen to them. So I think my kind of commitment to the cause, and I just keep saying the same thing over and over and over again, uh, people eventually in different ways, of course, people eventually start to listen yeah. and they, Serious, I think they take me seriously because they see me every day going into school at 6 45 in the morning and never miss a day. You know, like, oh, it, it, it's a bit odd to then start accusing me of this personal gain when I'm obviously in my school working hard for these kids. So, um, there's that. And also, I do my best. I mean, sometimes somebody might make me annoyed, but I do my best to to just keep ignoring you know the haters and to just keep going with the with with what i'm saying you know to be decent about what i'm saying to not be horrible to people even if i disagree with them uh to just keep explaining why i disagree what the reason is that i don't think that you know their position is correct on Twitter, I will do this quite a lot and I will just explain, this is why I think you're incorrect. Um, as opposed to calling them names, getting angry and all that sort of thing. Um, yeah. So what, if that's what you're saying, is you've, because you've stuck at it and you've gone about it in a, uh, you know, sort of a grown up fashion, you've earned the right to be heard. So even where people don't agree with you, you're saying they're now because you stuck at it, you know, started listening and some have changed their minds, but even where they haven't changed their minds, they're at least giving you the respect for what you've done. That's right. So quite a number of people, a number of people, I see this on Twitter a lot, will say, I don't agree with everything that you say, or I don't agree with much of what you say, <laughs> but I do respect what you do. Um, I respect who you are. That I get that a lot. Yeah. And then in terms of people that you disagree with, but whom you admire or respect, have you got any people that spring to mind in that regard, looking at it the other way around? Yeah, well, my father is one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he's a real lefty. He will, you know, he's always been a real lefty. He's Guyanese. He was great friends with Chetty Jagan, the old uh, president of Guyana, who considered himself to be an outright communist. Um, you know, they, I don't agree with any, you know, any, any, many of my father's political ideas. Um, but he's an extraordinary man. You know, he grew up without any shoes and, uh, came to England uh, looking for a better life for his children, sacrificed uh, everything really in order to give my sister and me a better life. 
Um, I'm very grateful to him. I have huge admiration for him. I totally disagree with him politically. <laughs> um, I, and, and that's the thing, you know, you can, um, you can be friends with people, you can have family who you disagree with. The key thing is to recognize their humanity, I think, and to recognize that they aren't bad people. They, they think differently to you because they have had different experiences, um, perhaps because they value different things. My father, for instance, had very different experiences. He uh, came to England in the day when there were, you know, posters in the windows telling him that he couldn't, you know, get a room in the house because of his skin color and, and so on. I mean, he, he, he had a very different experience. And, and certainly in, in those days, I understand why he is a man of the left. I totally get it. So I am... Um, it's to understand why the other person thinks the way that they do. Um, and he's now 83, you know, he's not really going to change his mind at 83, you know? Um, so, uh, so yeah, it's about being understanding and I always try and put myself in their shoes and I try to understand why it is they think the way that they do. Um, and I think a good trick in conversation when you're having a disagreement with somebody is to say, Okay, so hang on a second. This is what I'm hearing you say. Is that what you mean? You know, yeah. and just to check, because sometimes people have conversations and they're talking about two totally different things. I mean, that happens on Twitter all of the time. And of course, very difficult to have a conversation on Twitter, which is why I tend not to do it. You know, I, there's no point because who can have a conversation through email, let alone through a tweet, which is restricted in terms of the number of characters. I mean, it's impossible. Yeah. So, and actually, that, 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 that leads really nice on to um, a topic that I thought would be interesting for us to talk about. So there was uh, an interesting story in the press last week about a school, a primary school, where the head teacher was getting uh, flat um, for, amongst other things, having tattoos, but that's not really relevant, but for changing the name of the houses at their school from sort of classic British heroes like Nelson to contemporary heroes like Marcus Rashford and Greta Thunberg. Um, and uh, one of the newspapers that uh, started covering that story, then others jumped in, were pretty critical of that. Um, and then there was a lot of um, outpouring of feelings both ways about whether they should have changed the houses um, or whether they should have left them as they were. What do you do about teaching kids about British history? Um, you know, do you cover uh, British heroes, warts and all? And there was quite a lot of feeling on social media and elsewhere about that. What was your take on that particular, that particular story? Yeah, it's funny because I saw the story before it became a big thing on Twitter. And I saw what he'd done and I rolled my eyes and I thought, oh, for goodness sakes, you know, this is so ridiculous. Um, and then I ignored it. And, and the reason I ignored it was because I didn't want to uh, attack him for doing what he thought was right to do at his school. I'm a great believer in freedom for schools and for senior teams to make the right decisions, the decisions that they think are right for their school. And that's what he thought was right for his school. So I am, I back him a hundred percent in doing it. Um, I, and then perhaps it was even a day later, it was some time later, uh, that it all became a big storm on Twitter and I defended him. Um, I defended him because, uh, I think it is his right, uh, to do what's right for his school. Now I understand from people that they say, you know, this was decided, uh, with the school community. I mean, I have to say, changing the names of the houses, I mean, people who were really angry about it were saying, this is outrageous. And I was thinking, but it's just the names of the houses. I mean, who cares? <laughs> what I was thinking, you know, like, come on, there's a thousand things going on at school all the time. So what? He changed the names of the houses. Now, I, on the other hand, I also get it why people are upset because it's a symbol, isn't it? And it, 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 and it says, uh, especially in this day and age, what it says is uh, Greta is really important. Nelson isn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people are really fed up of this kind of woke agenda out there, which is all about promoting Greta and doing down uh, s some of our more traditional national heroes. Uh, now, I am of the mindset that one should be promoting more of those national heroes. Greta is certainly not top of my list for, um, you know, admiring. Uh, I find her, uh, you know, a, a troublesome character, actually. I think she encourages children to truant. Um, I think 
you know, I have a lot of respect for her and the things that she's done. Yes, at such a young age and um, she's very brave and, and I have admiration for her from that point of view. But I do worry about the kind of mad fame and the kind of adoration that comes, to, you know, with regards to Greta and, and the, the unquestioning um, reaction that sometimes schools have towards her. One, because she's a child. Two, because she's pro-environment. Put those two together. Well, it can only be a good thing. And, the, and, and, and rarely do you find in schools that people, people are critical of her. And that is problematic for me because I think children in schools should be taught how to think critically and think outside the box about stuff. And you can't do that if you are being uh, dealt a set of cards that tell you how you should think. And that's what all those people were annoyed about. The, the changing the houses said to them, you're this woke head teacher who's going in there and telling our kids what to think. And and apparently, I mean, somebody had said on Twitter that he was uh, he was very proud of the fact that the kids didn't, he said, oh, my kids won't even know who Drake and, you know, Nelson are. And I thought, what on earth, you know, how can you, like, isn't that a great thing is what he was saying. And and I just thought that's a bit weird. Um, well, I say it's a bit weird. It's not weird, actually. The problem is, is that it's all too common in this day and age. Yeah. Um, and that's why people are upset. Uh, I think I've just to come in, I think for me, the, 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 the thing I was most interested in on that, on that debate and on that issue was, like you said, teachers and head teachers have to be left to run schools as they see fit, um, whether it's naming houses. I mean, shock horror, Catherine, but Bedford Free School have now changed the names of the houses since I left to a different bunch of names. I'm, as you can imagine, I'm fuming about that. No, I honestly don't mind. <laughs> but, but for me, it, actually, it did raise a really interesting question about, um, particularly based on the public statements that that particular head teacher had made, that they, that they thought it was really important to teach kids about systemic racism and to get them to reflect on, you know, the world we live in in that regard. And I suppose for me, particularly running the campaign for common sense, that did worry me because I, 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 um, I am worried about, you know, contested issues being presented, particularly to younger children, um, as, as uncontested facts. So, so, you, so where do you think the line is between schools being free to, to do the things as they see fit? And wh where is the line in terms of when you're crossing over into telling kids stuff that maybe they shouldn't be? Well, it's a, it's a very difficult one, but it's always been difficult. You know, what is interesting to me is that, and sad uh, actually, is that people only seem to care about the nonsense that's going on in schools when it has to do with race. <laughs> Nobody seems to care about um, a, though the fact that there's really bad behavior in, in too many schools. <laughs> Nobody seems to care that there are kids being beaten up in the corridors and sometimes even in their classrooms. Nobody cares that kids have to train themselves not to go to the toilet all day because they're gonna get bullied badly in the, in the toilets, you know? Then nobody also seems to care about the fact that teaching methods are so poor that kids are not being taught properly in their lessons. You know, that the, the unions have such a grip on our schools that, um, that, 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 that schools are not able to flourish in the way that they should. Now, and, and the reason why I know this is that since I gave my speech in 2010, I have been interviewed by many a journalist. And whenever I would talk about the issues in schools, they say, really? Oh, is that what's going on? I, I think my school is perfectly fine. And I say, well, really, how do you know? And they say, well, I don't know. My kid seems fine. I say, yeah, he comes home from school. You say, how was your day? He says, fine. And then he goes to his room. You don't actually know what's going on in schools and nobody seems to care. Now, I, and that, and it's not a vote winner, is it? Nobody cares about education. Immigration is a vote winner. Economy is a vote winner. Nobody cares about education. Except suddenly everybody cares about education. And why do they care about education? Because suddenly it's about race. And I find that problematic in itself. But okay, you know, given that uh, beggars can't be choosers, maybe I should jump with it. I've been wanting people to take an interest in education for 10 years. <laughs> and now suddenly people are getting enraged about it. So maybe I should take that, that bone that they're throwing me. Now, um, and you're right. The kinds of things that are being taught in the lessons can be problematic. I would simply stress that has always been the case. Mm -hmm. It's just that people are only taking notice now because we're because it's a race issue, you know, identity politics. That's why they get you know people are getting head up. Um, and the thing is, is that though problematic ideas which have been left leaning for some time, you know, 30, 40 years, you know, we're talking a long time, that has pu been pushed in in the schools and in the universities we are finding that they are now taking over in terms of our general world space. 
Um, and that's because kids are coming through, <laughs> they're coming through schools and they're coming through universities and they've been taught to think in a particular kind of way. Um, they haven't been taught to think critically. They haven't been taught their two sides to the argument and so on, as you just suggested with regard to your point about systemic racism. So, um, yeah, that's a problem, but it's been a problem for some time. Um, do, you, I, I, do, you think, do, do you think we are going to be able to address that problem? Because my big concern is it, it suddenly is very divisive. It feels like it's got a lot more divisive in recent years. Do you think we can actually change the way things happen like that in schools? Or do you think if it's always been like that, it will always be like that? Yeah, I think that it, it's, a, it's an interesting question. And... Um, you know, I think, for instance, Michael Gove found this when he tried to change things in education. Uh, you can't pull a lever in government and then um, all the schools will then just obey. Uh, the thing is, is that teachers are teaching in these schools and if they genuinely think they're doing good things for the children by teaching them this stuff, then they're going to continue doing it. Um, so it's a question of trying to persuade people that what they're doing might not be helping the very children they want to help. Um, and that requires really a kind of national campaign <laughs> that requires a lot more than what is currently going on. And so, no, I don't think things are going to change. I think things will get much worse as time goes on. America shows us what, it, what is the next step, you know. Uh, they are obviously much further along in that kind of journey of wokeness than we are. And um, I think that we need to be very wary of where we might end up. Uh, and the problem is, is that governments and politicians, you know, they have, they're so busy doing other things. It's very difficult to kind of create some kind of national campaign around this. And, and also, I imagine that anyone who did so might just get called a racist, you know? So... It's a, it's a hard one. I, I'm not sure I know what the answer is. And yet the irony is, you know, it has for a long, 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 long time um, been within the law that schools have to, when they cover political issues, do them in an impartial way. And I think the phrase in both bits of legislation is um, if they cover a political issue, they have to give a balance, they have to do it in a balanced way and yes. offer credible alternative viewpoints. Yes. So, and yet still, you know, and I know, and I know certainly from the work we did um, last year at Campaign for Common Sense, uh, particularly from parents sharing resources and lessons and assemblies and newsletters and so on with us, a huge number of schools are absolutely breaking the law in terms of the kind of stuff they're doing. So we've already got the law in place. It's really just asking schools to follow the law. And we'd expect schools to follow the law in health and safety. And we'd expect them to follow the law in terms of safeguarding. Um, why do you think following the law around impartiality is, is seen by lots of people as being different? Well, it's very difficult to be impartial. And especially if you believe that, um, let's take Greta, for example, you know, it, 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 that's not a race thing. Uh, it's a good example. You know, uh, climate change, uh, I know, I mean, I believe in climate change. I believe it's happening. Um, I recycle and I, you know, I don't know, use Sainsbury's, you know, bags all the time and go to the Sainsbury's with them and all that stuff. Um, but there are some people who don't believe in climate change. Uh, that Those set of people who don't believe in climate change, I, I, I don't think are ever spoken about in schools, ever. Uh, children are taught that the environment is, is at risk in these kinds of ways. And these are the things we need to do about it. And actually, we're not doing enough. That's what they're taught. And so no wonder they're all wanting to march out and they're really worried about it because they don't realize that actually it perhaps is an interesting discussion. Now, I mean, I don't even realize, I don't know much about it. I know there's a bunch of people out there who think that um, th there isn't any climate change. I don't really know anything about it. And I don't know anything about it because everything I'm told in the media and so on tells me that there is climate change. And I believe that there's climate change. Yeah. Um, but also I was going to say that when it comes to talk, e even if kind of the settled view is that climate change is happening and all that stuff, there isn't often a debate in a proper critical way within schools about the different ways we can address it. Again, I think that's my concern. It's kind of like Extinction Rebellion or you're a climate change denier rather than like Extinction Rebellion would say this and that's a legitimate viewpoint, uh, but maybe this government thinks that we should do that and other people think we should do this. There's not even a debate around that, is there? No, but I, that's because I don't even think we know what that, I don't even know what it is. 
I mean, to be honest, I don't know what the climate deniers are saying. I don't know. I mean, like, and I don't, I don't think most teachers would know. Uh, like, there's an there's an overarching embedded culture in schools to to think in a particular kind of way. And if all your friends think, for instance, uh, there is systemic racism or um, you know women are oppressed in X, Y, and Z ways. If all your friends think so, if all your colleagues think so, if all the textbooks say so, then how are you meant to think otherwise? I mean, people are blaming teachers, but I don't really know how on earth they're meant to think outside that box. <laughs> they don't have the materials. They don't have the culture around them. They don't have the people around them. So, you know, maybe uh, some conservative people might like to go into teaching. That would be one option. Uh, I don't see them doing it in droves. Uh, there's loads of lefties who join teaching. Conservatives don't do it. Well, where are you, conservatives? You can all sit on the sidelines and complain all the time. Well, get into schools, you know? I mean, I, I, I'm in there. I'm in schools. I'm doing stuff. I'm fighting this stuff all the time. I'm fighting it on Twitter. I'm fighting it everywhere. Um, what are you doing? I mean, not you, Mark. I mean, <laughs> I'd say, what, what are the people doing who are complaining all the time? Because it's all very well sitting on your keyboard and writing out your tweets, but what are you actually doing about any of this? You know? Well, that is a perfect point. Thank you, Kev. That's a perfect point to move on to some of the questions from our audience. And if you're watching this and, you ha and you've got a question you'd like us to ask Catherine and you haven't yet done so, now's the time to do it using the, the Q&A button at the bottom. So, Catherine, um, here's a question from Stephen. And we've got quite a few come through. So, um, yeah, well, let's see how many we can get through. Question from Stephen. What was the, if you could only do one thing, what would be the one thing you would do to improve state education in general? One thing. Uh, I believe that sunlight is the best disinfectant and I would force all school, schools to be open at all times to visitors to see every classroom. Uh, as it is, uh, many schools are never open, ever, even uh, in October when they're meant to be open during the days for visits for year six families to see what they're like. Uh, obviously, I'm talking about secondary schools, but same thing with primary schools. Um, and... Uh, so you can't even get in then. The few schools you might be able to get into, you get in for two or three open mornings, but they are set in, during a particular time and you can only go down, they'll make sure you only go down certain corridors, you only see certain classrooms. You come to Michaela, you can come anytime you like, right? You, you will be taken around by the children and they will show you every classroom, right? So uh, I think sunlight is the best disinfectant. Open our schools so everyone can see what they're like. Thank you. Okay, so if you, um, when uh, we get out of lockdown and uh, Michaela is open again to visitors, I would recommend people come and visit it if they can. It's really worth looking at. Um, next question then about one of the key um, things that underpins Michaela, which is sort of your warm, strict approach to culture or, or discipline. Um, and this is a question from John, John Bald. How do you get, how do you balance warmth and strictness and how, how would you advise others to get that right balance? Yeah. Okay, so you give out the demerit. Oh, come on, Johnny. You're forcing me to give you a demerit there. I really didn't want to, come on. That sort of thing. Uh, when you give out the detention or whatever it is, um, you make sure that you have a chat with them at some point. Maybe it's in the detention, out of the detention, so you can repair that relationship. Um, you need to make sure that when you hand out the detention, you're narrating why you've handed it out. Okay, mm -hmm. got to give you detention there. And it's because you turned around, you had a bit of a chat, already warned you, ah, you leave me no choice. Uh, not only are you narrating it so that Johnny can hear, you're narrating it so the whole class can hear. Um, you don't get really angry in the moment. So notice I'm saying, oh, come on, da, 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 and you're kind of jokey about it and you're nice about it, um, but you're still holding the line. So you're not allowing them to get away with it and saying, oh gosh, I'm just going to let it go. You're being nice and friendly about how you do it but you are holding the line. And so, and over time, that consistency will build a respect for you and the children will understand what they, what you, what, what you, what you expect of them. I would also suggest that you make your rules really clear at the beginning um, so that they know how to please you and they know what will displease you. Because it can be really difficult uh, for children in schools where there's a whole variety of practice from classroom to classroom. So it's important that you make it clear that in your classroom, these are your expectations, and this is what will happen if you do X, and this is what will happen if you do Y. So it's not just what you do around warmth and strictness, 
but how you communicate what you're doing and how consistently you do it. I think that's what you're saying, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, moving on then, here's a question from someone called Kieran. What perspective advice do you have for those who are applying for a PGCE um, this autumn? Yeah, well, you know, sadly it's COVID, so you can't go out. I was about to say you need to go out loads right now because when you start, tell your friends they're not going to see you for the next <laughs> three months. <laughs> um, you know, and I'm being serious. You tell them all, I'm going under. You're not going to see me. It was really nice being friends with you. I'll see you in January. And um, you are going to work really, really hard. You must go to bed at nine o'clock every night. Um, uh, don't take things to heart. Uh, when, I mean, I say in January, actually with the PGC, you won't really get into things probably until October, November. So maybe it's from October, November that when you're in your schools, I mean, really from when you're placed in your schools, um, and love the kids, you know, when the kids, uh, are mean to you and they will be, um, don't, don't blame them. You know, it's just the way that it is. I mean, what I mean by that is kids are kids, they will push back. If the school that you're placed in doesn't have really tight behavior systems, they will be rude because they've got used to being able to be rude. So it's not you, it's not them. You just need to win them over. And the way you win them over is you just keep on going and um, you're inspirational and you tell them that you love them. And you might not feel comfortable saying, I love you, but you could, when I say you tell them that you love them, you mark their work, you uh, get enthusiastic about stuff they've done well. Um, you give them gold stars, you know, you, you show them that you love them. You ask them about where they got the haircut or what they, you know, who, which football team they support or whatever it is. Um, and you get to know them and uh and keep going it will get better it's very very hard at the beginning but it does improve with time <laughs> thank you i think that's really really useful advice um actually not just for people starting their teacher training but people for early on in the in the career full stop isn't it it's just yeah and a bit about a bit about go out now so you because you're not going to be going out when you get in there very very true um we've got a couple of like similar questions here now so i've got one here from george saying do you think the government should prohibit um, critical race theory and associated things at school and then another question from someone who didn't give their name saying um what do you think about um queer theory and identity gender identity stuff like stonewall do you think that should be taught in school as well yeah i mean i don't think these things should be taught in school whether or not uh the government should ban them from being taught in school i'm not sure i I don't like, I'm, I'm, I'm a freedom lover, so I don't like the idea of banning things. You know, I don't like the state coming in and banning. On the other hand, I understand why you're asking because it is a real issue. The, the thing is, is that people need to be persuaded. And, you know, I suspect because this is the campaign for common sense that the people who are listening are people who are probably a little bit more right-leaning, probably um, are a bit fed up of critical race theory. <laughs> so I get it, so am I, right? Um, but what you don't, I tell you what you don't want to do, um, and what I see happening far too often on the right is that they're so fed up of what the left is doing that they want the same draconian measures that the left has imposed on the right to happen to those on the left. So they celebrate, for instance, if someone on the left gets canceled, mm -hmm. the right people on the right celebrate when some kind of leftist idea has been squashed, you know, and so the idea for, or they're pro the idea of government coming in and stopping critical race theory. And I'm always wanting to say, hello, you, we're leaning on the right. Hello, don't you remember? We're meant to be pro-freedom. <laughs> we're meant to not want a bigger state and we don't want the state interfering in our lives. Um, so uh, I think you need to resist that temptation. Um, the key thing, I mean, although I know all, all, your viewers will say, well, what's the solution then, Catherine? <laughs> I don't know what the solution is. Uh, like I said, we need some kind of national campaign. We need lots of people talking about this stuff. We need campaigns like the Campaign for Common Sense, you know, conversations like this one where we're trying to get people involved. The problem is, is that, as I said, I suspect the people who are listening to this are people who are already this way inclined anyway, you know? It's how do you and get... I, I, I was going to say, one of the challenges we've had is trying to get people who take different views to us or, or different views to what they think we've got 
actually to come in and talk with us because actually I love, as you all know, I'm like, I love ideas. I love talking to people who've got different ideas. Um, you know, I am in my circle of friends like the token Tory. In many regards, I was the token Brexiteer when that was relevant. And, and when I grew up, I was the token traditional Catholic who had a very different worldview of my parents, you know, to all my yeah. friends. So I'm quite comfortable with different and learning about different ideas. But a lot of people that hold these different ideas aren't so keen for discussing them, sharing them, challenging them. Um, and it's how do we get people to engage in that debate, isn't it? Yes. And, you know, I think, in a well, I don't know. I was about to say social media like Twitter and so on, in a way, polarizes the debate because it's so impossible to have discussions. On the other hand, where I have found Twitter to be really a useful tool. Um, so I joined Twitter just soon after my speech and then, so 2010, 2011, let's say, and then I, I came off it uh, almost immediately um, for a couple, few years because it was so nasty and so vitriolic. I had to get off there. So I came off and then I realized, well, I could come on and I could block people and so on. And I could just, you know, um, and plus obviously things had calmed down by then because people were particularly mean after my speech. Um, and what I found it really useful for is being able to tell people what I think. So I can then just tweet and, you know, sometimes I retweet something and I'll make a comment on something that someone said and said, oh, this point, you know, I disagree with it or I agree with it. or This is, you know, this is an interesting point and so on. And um, I'm able to kind of uh, tell everybody this is what I think about these things. And it's through having done that over years that people have changed their minds <laughs> because they read me over and over again and gradually they start to piece together a kind of image and understanding of what of the things that I think. So in that sense, it's been really helpful. But on the other hand, you know, I, I quite enjoy uh, retweeting things, uh, mainly because sometimes I read something and it makes me think of something and then I comment on the tweet that somebody has said. And, um, and then sometimes some of my followers or not even my followers, random people are, are really mean to that person, you know, and, and, and they start attacking them. And then I have to tell my followers off and say, stop being so mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> disagree, but don't be rude. And, and then I, I, and then I don't know what to do. And then I think, well, maybe I shouldn't retweet anybody. And then, but then I think, but I like retweeting because I like commenting on what other people are saying. So it, it, it almost stops the conversation, you know, and. So, and, and Twitter in that sense can polarize people because people end up, uh, you know, lots of people stop following me because well, in the end, they don't think I'm saying what they want to hear. So they stop following me, you know? And, um, and people just surround themselves. They put themselves in an echo chamber, don't they? You know? Yeah. And, and then if anybody says something that's different to that echo chamber, they get really angry about it because they think who on earth are you to think that? I don't know. I, 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 it's, it's a very, it's, it's very hard. I, in fact, I have huge uh, respect for you, Mark, doing this campaign for common sense because it's a, it, it's a massive. Um, well, it's just a massive thing to try and make happen, really. <laughs> well, I mean, and thank you for your part today in, in helping us in helping us to do that. Now, the, one one final question, then we'll start to wrap it up because I know I know you need to get away, uh, and that is. So we talk about schools, but let's talk about the workplace. Like, how do you think? people should go about um, pushing back uh, against sort of the equality, diversity and inclusion things which are coming into the workplace now. For instance, I was chatting to a guy recently who actually, as it happens, is a, is a black British guy um, but whose um, employers are trying to get all of their staff as part of their performance management targets to have an equality, diversity and inclusion target. Um, and this uh, black British guy I think, suggested that they, um, they should maybe be an ally for a white colleague so they could mentor the white person on um, on their inherent racism and how not to be so racist and stuff like that. Have you got any thoughts? Because, you know, you've been you've been commenting on lots of different issues over the years, but, you know, including uh, the issue of race. Have you got any suggestions about how people can politely uh, push back against these kind of things in the workplace? Yeah. I don't know. You're asking me impossible questions. Um, it, 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 it is very hard for a white person uh, in that situation to be able to push back because they will just get called a racist. Um, it's great if you can find somebody who isn't white who might question these kinds of things. And then the two of you could go and approach the bosses. Um, the problem is that the bosses are also, and you've got to see it from the point of view of the bosses. The bosses are also under a lot of pressure to make these changes. They're under pressure from 
I don't know, their boards and their stakeholders, the, the, the public actually, what they expect on the website. You got to put up your letter to say you support BLM. I refuse to do that, but I'm a bit crazy, you know, like you, you got to take, you're taking your life in your hands when you refuse to do what the, the majority of people are doing. So you got to feel sorry for the boss in that sense and understand why he's making those decisions. Um, I, 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 I suppose you try and talk them through the reasons why you think it's not a good idea. Having a target to meet some arbitrary target for whatever reason, let's hire more tall people, let's hire more, you know, curly haired people or whatever it is, seems to be a bit, bit silly. Um, and yes, uh, th th there may be racism and there may be issues for, you know, gay people and all sorts of things like that in, in the world. But obviously we want to do our best to hire the, the right person for the job. Now, what I would say is that where the right uh, is somewhat disingenuous about, about this argument is that uh, they take the point of view always, got to appoint the best person to the job. That's all you do, and that's easy. Now, the thing is, is that that never happens, right? That, that's just not true. Uh, the best person for the job is never appointed, right? <laughs> uh, often people make mistakes. <laughs> um, sometimes people appoint people with the idea of, well, we want somebody with the right skill set that fits in here and there, but they might not necessarily be the best. Uh, deciding who the best person is for the job is actually really hard. It's not like there's some test and everybody sits the test and whoever gets the highest score on the test gets appointed. It, it's a whole variety of things that goes into deciding who's going to be the right person for that job. And, um, it's just dishonest, I think, to say, well, that's it. You support the right person for the job and that's it. Um, and that is what the other side then is, is, act, is, 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 is doesn't like hearing because they're saying, look, come on, you're being silly. You know, um, that, that, that isn't, you know, that isn't true. And so when the, the guys on the right say, oh yeah, well, the reason why it tends to be white middle-class men who are in the top jobs, it's because we're all the best person for the job. <laughs> the guys on the left say, that's a load of nonsense. And I think it is actually a load of nonsense. <laughs> so, um, however, where I don't agree with the guys on the left is the way to try and address uh, the, those kinds of issues, which, and I think there are issues there, is not to get put out quotas. That's ridiculous. Uh, and, you know, I, I would always say that um, you just, you just got to be excellent at what you do, whoever you are. Uh, and maybe it's true that black people need to be more excellent. I don't know. Well, then fine, be more excellent. <laughs> um, you know, like that's the only way that you're going to change anything is by being excellent and by pers pursuing uh, excellence always by being resilient, by being, uh, by persevering, and you keep on going. You don't say to people, put in a quota, so then you have to appoint me, even when I'm not the best person for the job. I mean, how embarrassing and humiliating is that? I mean, I don't want that. And the worst thing is, is that when you have been appointed, uh, because you're really good, then people don't even think you're really good, because everyone then looks at you and goes, oh, well, they were, they were the token. <laughs> Who wants that? You know, that, this is not progress. So, um, I suppose it's about putting those arguments forward to people, uh, trying to open up debate around it and trying to be reasonable. You will see that when I just talked about that issue, I, I, I gave both sides of the argument, you know, and I can see it from both sides, uh, from both points of view. And I'll tell you, that is always the case in everything. So Greta has a point. I don't like her, but she has a point. <laughs> and she's really inspirational in many ways. I wouldn't name a house after her, <laughs> but <laughs> I get why kids like her. And so <laughs> it's about trying to see both sides um, and, and then doing something about it. Uh, and I don't think hiding behind a keyboard on Twitter counts as doing something about it. <laughs> Thank you. That was that was a really thorough and uh, considered response to a question that I sort of sprang on you. Final question then, because I know you've got to get off. And um, if you had a magic wand and you could either pass a new law or remove a law or change a law, you know, the Burblesing Act or the Burblesing Amendment to try and improve things for society, what would that be? One law, one change, what would it be? Um... Is it a law or can I wave a magic wand? <laughs> uh, well, you might need the magic wand to, to, to change the law, but because it's you, Catherine, you can wave a magic wand. There you go. <laughs> well, what I'd really like 
is for us if we really couldn't people say they don't see race but it, what they mean when they say that i think is that they don't act on it and it's not true they do <laughs> and i really wish that not just race but class and sexuality and all that stuff i really wish that we just couldn't see it i wish that i could wave a magic wand and make it so that every time you met somebody else you just treated them like another human being um because uh that isn't what we do anymore and too often in schools um it, it, not just with regard to race with regard to class um we expect different things from children uh according to their backgrounds and we think to ourselves well you know you live on an estate or you're black or you've got a single mom or whatever it is, you can't really achieve as much as somebody else. So I'm not going to expect as much from your homework. I'm not going to expect you to be on time. Uh, that's just in schools, let alone we, we choose what we're going to teach them in the curriculum according to what the skin color is and all that sort of thing. Uh, we, I say all that sort of thing. So we think to ourselves, uh, Mozart is great for white kids, whereas Stormzy is better for black kids, for instance. Um, and I, um, it, 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 it's not just there, it's also in the workplace. It is everywhere. And, uh, and and this isn't just from the left, it's from the right, this is everybody. So I would wave a magic wand so that we could just see each other's humanity. So I really, really love the response, Catherine. Thank you so much for that. Thank you um, for joining us tonight. Thank you everyone else who's been watching tonight. Our next webinar is gonna be in a few weeks time with Helen Puckrose of Cynical Theories fame and who's recently set up Counterweight, who's looking at similar issues to what we've been talking to tonight. Uh, Catherine, thank you again. Really love to see you. I bet the audience would have got a lot out of that. Uh, good luck when everyone is back in, at Michaela next week. Um, and looking forward to speaking to you personally soon. And again, thank you audience for joining us tonight. Goodbye, Thanks. everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.